Perfect. So, told you that would be quick. Um, Kevin, we have Kevin Bewley and Claudine Gibson uh, from the Auckland Zoo to give us an update on the Auckland Zoo and their sustainability initiatives. They have a presentation. So, we'll go through the uh, presentation first in, in full, and then we'll go for questions after that. So, thank you very much to uh, both of you for being here and coming to let us know what you're up to at the at the zoo, so thanks. Kia ora koutou. Um, ko Kevin Bewley aho. Um, as Richard says, I'm the director of Auckland Zoo and delighted to have uh, Claudine Gibson, our environmental initiatives advisor, working exclusively at the zoo. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk today about what we're doing and the journey we've been on uh, as an organisation. Um, for a number of years, well, for the last 15 years, really, we've been increasingly defining ourselves um, as a good modern zoo. And as a good modern zoo, the primary focus, the exclusive focus, is around wildlife conservation and engaging our community with wildlife. So for the last 12 years, our mission has been to bring people together to build a future for wildlife um, with the four strategic intents you see below. Our mission and those strategic intents have been heavily influenced and guided by those four roadmap documents you see on the right. Um, they've all been produced by the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Um, and I guess the take-home message for that is we operate within uh, a global framework as a good modern zoo. Um, and the need for a good modern zoo has really been never more great than it is now. And I'm probably telling you things you already are aware, but, but just as the slide demonstrates there, we've had a, a doubling of the human population in the past 40 years. Significant decreases in, in biodiversity and loss of wildlife, significant increases in population urbanization, both in this country and overseas. Um, and as a wildlife conservation science organization and a good modern zoo, our primary purpose, our primary purpose is to connect with our community, to connect them with wildlife, and to then deliver measurable conservation learning and social impacts. So, so the role of a good modern zoo, particularly in an urban setting, has never been more important. The issue we have um, is the perception problem um, and maintaining and nurturing our social license to operate. We have an issue with that because the vast majority of zoos on this planet are not at all good. Um, and I've, I've talked about this frequently, um, and I was going to about to say that 90% of zoos on this planet should either be drastically improved or shut down tomorrow. Um, if 90% of restaurants and hotels were bad, you'd stop going to restaurants and hotels. Um, so we have a perception problem, um, both the persistence of bad zoos, and I can't believe I've actually put a picture of Joe Exotic up there, um, but also the legacy of, of Auckland Zoo itself. Um, so not too, too long ago, we were giving elephant rides and we had polar bears in appalling conditions. So we've got the legacy issue, we've got the continuing persistence of um, bad zoos, and so it's understandable perhaps, or completely understandable, that a lot of people may have an issue with zoos. So this is something we've been directly addressing um, in our approach over recent years. Um, we're unique in that we're accredited not just by the Australasian Zoo Association, but also by the European Zoo Association. Um, which independently verifies us for animal care and welfare standards. And we will say unashamedly that the animals in our care in many ways have a, have a better life than their counterparts in the wild right now. Um, we're very clear about us being not for profit. Um, and that's, that's largely I mean, great thanks and acknowledgement to Auckland Council um, being part of Auckland Unlimited for that support to allow us to do that. That we have clear wildlife conservation, learning and social mission objectives, and that we are very much science and research driven. So by really pushing those things with our community, um, we, we hopefully feel that they can then increasingly trust us, um, can feel happy for the animals in our care, and feel proud about our role in our city and what we do for wildlife in Auckland, um, across New Zealand, and, and indeed overseas. So with that bit of background, um, talking specifically about the environmental impact uh, that we aim to have, we can broadly consider it on two main fronts. And again, 
though the activities in this area are very much driven and guided by the two roadmap documents on the right, um, the World Zoo Sustainability Strategy at the top and the Conservation Education Strategy below. Um, very proudly, we can say that that Conservation Education Strategy, that global strategy, um, was developed and written by our Head of Conservation Advocacy and Engagement at the zoo, Dr. Sarah Thomas. We're very incred incredibly proud of that. But the two main fronts I'm talking about is uh, the environmental sustainability of our own operation um, and then our community conservation advocacy and engagement activities. Put more simply, um, number one is us walking the talk and number two is about us talking the walk. And I constantly get those the wrong way around. And I've no doubt I will this morning at some point. Um, just a quick note that those two strategy documents and therefore our mission and our strategic intents are very much guided by the UN 17 Sustainability Development Goals and you'll increasingly see these referenced in advocacy material coming out of the zoo and our hope in the long term is obviously that we link to the initiatives within council and more broadly um, on a national scale. So just to focus for a moment on walking the talk and the actual environmental sustainability of our own operation, we can't tell people, talk to people about living more sustainable lives and encouraging that if we're not doing it ourselves. And so we've been on quite a journey in recent years. Just a, a very brief snapshot. Um, back in 2012, we eliminated the use of single-use plastic bags entirely on site. More recently, in 2018, um, with a little bit of consternation initially from our community, we removed all single-use water bottles from site, so provided drinking fountains instead. That did hit our revenue streams, because it was obviously the most popular drink, um, but doing the right thing by the environment um, was more of a priority for us, and is still. Um, in 2019, um, we removed all single-use um, coffee cups in our catering outlets, um, so used a, a reusable system called Again Again, which is available in a number of cafes around the city. Um, unfortunately, COVID has meant uh, the impacts of Level 2 um, meant that we had to return to the single-use cups, so we're looking at a longer-term solution there. Um, most recently, last year, uh, working with our joint venture catering partner, Montana, um, we're now in a position where all of our zoo food packaging um, uses no single-use plastic anymore, so it's all compostable, basically. So those are, those are a, a few of the individual initiatives we've, we've been pursuing over recent years. Um, much of it is geared towards our, our journey and our establishment now as a Carbon Zero um, accredited organization. So back in 2015-16, we engaged with Toy2 um, and we established our baseline carbon levels, um, which you can see there in the first column. And with that, we then identified associated reduction, carbon reduction targets, overall 20% reduction over that five-year period from 2016 through to now, um, with a brief summary there of the main headline targets for reduction. So how have we done? Well, over the last four years, and we're currently measuring the final year five now, you can see the overall trend is in the right direction and, and, and tracking down towards um, controlling our emissions. How have we done that? Well, our four key top emitting by source things are electricity, natural gas, land for waste going to landfill, and air travel, all trending generally down. Just to focus a bit on, on waste management as an example. So um, last year, oh, it's actually almost two years ago now, uh, the purpose of this initiative is to prevent or decrease the amount of waste going to landfill. Our target was actually 75% um, diversion from landfill. Um, working with Clean Event, we basically take all waste from the zoo, whether that's staff produced, animal produced, or visitor produced, to the top of a specially established station at the top of the hill, where all waste is sorted. Um, that which can be recycled goes off to recycling. Soft plastics is correct, uh, collected by Green Gorilla that then goes to Future Post for production of fence posts. 
Um, the enormous amount of natural browse material we use gets chipped and recycled um, on site and used in the bedding areas around the zoo. Our poo, um, in partnership with Zoodoo, gets recycled into manure. And so, pardon me, sorry? On site, yeah. Um, so all of these initiatives collectively um, mean that we're currently tracking, I remember our target was 75%, we're diverting about 88.5% of our current waste from landfill. Um, so that's had a significant effect on our overall emissions as an organisation. Just to focus a little bit on water, we all know the issues around it as a premium resource within our region, um, and it is a key focus for us given the amount we potentially use on site, both potable and non-potable. Um, we had a target of a 20% reduction over that five-year period. Since 2016, we're tracking at about 50% reduction in potable water use. We've achieved that largely through um, shifting to rainwater collection and use of collective rainwater or using non-potable sources but also a significant investment in controlling um, water leakage and the installation of um, monitoring systems and um, tracking systems so we can monitor how much, and low flow um, installations so we can track how much we're using and limit the amount we're using. So we're tracking in the right direction with water. Similarly with electricity, um, installing metering across site allows us to identify those key areas which might be particularly heavy use and then have mitigating um, actions to help limit and control the amount of electricity we're using. So that's just two initiatives. There's a whole load of stuff going on at the moment and Claudine is kept particularly busy on site um, and it speaks of a, of a cultural organizational approach to environmental sustainability. So we're, we're currently looking at things and, and actively pursuing how we reuse and recycle our uniforms, where we source our animal food from, where we source our food for our visitors from, the sustainability and the sourcing of our, our goods in our retail outlets, how our staff and our visitors get to the zoo, the, the organizations we engage with to, that provide our services and their environmental sustainability credentials, similarly with the partnerships and sponsorship arrangements we get in, and there's a real minefield there that I won't get, go into in any kind of detail. Um, how we deliver maintenance and construction on site, and the, the traceability of our supply chains. So all of these things help build a picture of us as a, a, a good modern zoo um, which is us being that sustainable, environmentally aware organization. One key thing to mention is that this, this necessarily has to happen at a grassroots level. So it's not just about me as director or Claudine as initiatives advisor delivering this. The Zoo Green team is about the staff shifting that culture, embedding these behaviors, these changes within the organization as a whole, across the staff, across the volunteers, and then to our, our community as they visit us. So all of this enables us, I hope, to talk with some legitimacy to our community about what we're doing and the importance of changing behaviours and adopting a more sustainable way of life. So our primary role as a conservation organisation is to deliver those memorable and meaningful experiences for everybody that engages with us. Yes, we do a lot of conservation breeding stuff, and this, this project in particular is one, one I'm... I'm particularly proud of. So this is the cobble skink, little brown skink from South Island, west coast near Granity. This is now extinct in the wild. Um, this is a species that's gone extinct in the wild in the last five years in this country, despite all the conservation work we're doing. This species only now exists in a conservation breeding program at the zoo. Um, so the work we do in terms of the species we care for, the species we breed, the species we reintroduce, for many is the difference between extinction um, or persistence. But having said that, our primary role is about engaging with our community. It's about being absolutely compelling in our storytelling and in our calls to action for wildlife and the environment. So zoos on their own are not gonna save the planet, but the team of five million, the team of 1.7 million within Auckland, if we change what we do, absolutely can. Um, not only 
driving positive behavior change for the environment, but in doing that, we, we're having a measurable effect on social well-being, health, and social cohesion. So it's a double whammy when we do what we do properly. So it's not difficult, um, well, it's not easy to escape, I should say, um, all the stories we hear about uh, ecosystem degradation um, and the triple effects. The UN came out last week with a paper um, talking about the triple emergency of climate disruption, escalating pollution, and biodiversity loss. So there's no shortage of stories and calls to action for the zoo to tell. What's key for us, I think, moving forward is that our evolving conservation advocacy framework engages directly with the aims and, and the objectives of the climate emergency declaration of, of council and indeed of, of our country. And we are uniquely placed, I believe, to link these environmental and sustainability, sustainability, sustainability issues that we face to the impacts on animals and ecosystems. And, and people relate and connect their wildlife in a way by visiting a zoo that they don't, wouldn't otherwise do on, on TV or reading news articles or journal articles. So it's a unique opportunity we have to engage with over 700,000 visitors each year, tracking towards 900,000, even a million over the next 10 years. So it's really important that we get the stories that we tell and the calls to action that we're asking for right. So how do we provide those compelling experiences? Well, it starts with the habitats we provide, and, and thanks to the support of Council over recent years through the LTP and investment in the renewal of the zoo and the infrastructure of our 100-year-old our site, um, we're generating, creating increasingly compelling experiences for our community. Couldn't pass up this opportunity to put up a few slides of our, of our new development. Some of you have been out and seen it already, um, but our Southeast Asia jungle track is, is now partially open um, with a first phase um, being orangutans and siamang. Yes, this is a, an urban zoo site in Auckland. Uh, this is not Sumatran rainforest we're looking at, and, and this is all thanks to the, the support of council that we've been able to deliver it. Um, so the habitats for Siamang and Orangs um, and borrowing the incredible landscape we have that we're fortunate to have out in Western Springs. The, the aerial pathways have been an incredible attraction for the community, compelling. We're seeing a shift in the demographics of the people that are visiting the zoo, a lot more young, young adults, teenagers coming in specifically to see the Siamang and Orangs um, doing their things on the high wires there. Um, and the animals themselves are absolutely loving it. That's my favorite picture. Um, towards the end of this year, um, we will be opening the new tiger habitat. And Easter next year, hopefully, will be the opening of our tropical dome that will have um, freshwater crocodiles in there. So all about creating the habitats and the experiences that have people empathizing with wildlife and in a position where they're ready to listen to messages and, and feel compelled to take action for wildlife. It's not just about the habitats, the static habitats. We've also done a lot of work in recent years in about creating those wow surprise experiences for visitors. So um, the free flight, we call it flight school, um, and getting our birds out into the zoo and flying over people's heads and creating those memorable experiences that, that last a lifetime. Important for us is, is ensuring accessibility of the zoo as far as possible, so we know that price is still the biggest barrier to visitation. Um, but through partnership programs such as this with the warehouse, we're able to get low decile schools in and experience in the zoo for the very first time. Our volunteer program has come on in leaps and down leaps and bounds over the last 40 years, not only provides an opportunity for people to work directly with the zoo as a volunteer, but also provides a unique perspective for visitors interacting with those volunteers who are increasingly delivering that advocacy role for us. And it's not just about the experiences in the zoo now. Um, increasingly, we're taking the zoo out into the community, and so this is one of our outreach programs where we're taking schools out into the wild. 
one of the benefits, if I can say this, of the COVID lockdown was that we, we with the zoo being shut for extended periods, um, we focused very heavily on increasing our online content. And so now it's not just about engaging our community and the people that come to the zoo, but it's also the hundreds of thousands in this country, but also abroad that are engaging with us in, a, in the online space. And it's, it's another mechanism by which um, we can deliver that conservation messaging and that, those calls to action. So I very much see this as the, as the, the beginning of a long journey for us as, as this conservation organization. And I'm increasingly looking as director through Auckland Unlimited to link with council's priorities. Um, so fantastic news in the last 24 hours that we're going to be able to support um, the activities of the Climate Action Plan through the education program at the zoo, um, but significant opportunities for a much more citywide approach around climate emergency action, with the zoo being a hub for the community in that space. One of the key areas that I'm particularly passionate about and would love to get off the ground is to make much more, um, much more of a focus around our, our places as, as the city of sales with the harbors on both sides. And to establish, imagine the zoo, uh, oh sorry, the city I should say, as a marine conservation reserve, a terrestrial marine conservation reserve, where, where when you walk around the city, no matter what restaurant you go to, what cafe you go to, what supermarket you go to, the only choices are sustainable fish, um, that we are a single use plastic free city, that we have no take areas in the two har no take areas for fish in the two harbors, that everybody within the city is in some way engaged and knowledgeable about our importance as a marine city um, and gets engaged one way or another. And sorry if I've gone over time, Councillor, but um, that was a whirlwind journey through our environmental initiatives at the moment. That was perfect. Thank you so much, um, Kevin and Claudine. That's a massive... Um, amount of work and that's exactly why I um, wanted you guys to come in to share with um, the committee members all the, and that's only a slice of all the amazing things you're doing at the zoo and with our community. So thank you very much. First of all, we have a few questions. So our first question is from Councillor uh, Walker. Phenomenal commendations first. I mean, just um, amazing work. Um, my uh, question just goes to um, the reporting from the zoo and um, obviously reporting as it goes to the CCOs, Auckland Un Unlimited. So as far as the zoo is concerned, we've got a, a different investment proposition. I mean, you're delivering around um, conservation, you're, you're probably leading climate change across the council and a whole lot of stuff. And it would be great to have some measurables around this so that on my part and the part of councillors we can justify more investment in the zoo because I think there's a phenomenal investment um, proposition um, there and and I think that you know with more investment you could do um, you could do even more it's clearly a center of excellence and it needs to be um, recognized on that basis I think in terms of the reporting that other zoos do um, and I'm talking about some of the best zoos, that there are reporting mechanisms that are really good. So I'd invite your, your feedback around that. So actually, I completely agree with you, Councillor, in terms of, of we need to be good zoos on this planet, we need to be much better at talking about the impacts we have, um, both from a conservation breeding perspective, a scientific research perspective, but importantly, the, the, the environmental and social impacts that we have with our communities. It's a piece of work that we, we, we started in the last couple of years about how we specifically measure our impacts. Um, we're looking at, at the social um, impact measures that, that council um, yourselves have. Um, it's something that we're talking with the Zoo Association in Australasia about how we have a joined up approach for measuring the impacts of, of good modern zoos because it's standing against those zoos that persist, that, that, that aren't doing all this stuff. Um, in terms of providing a clear narrative and, and um, list of impacts for you as, as an organization direct to council, 
Um, obviously, that would come through our reporting to Auckland Unlimited and the board, and, and be very pleased to talk with you further about specifically what type of information would help, um, because it's a journey we're going on at the moment, and, and what we might think it's important to talk about as a zoo might not have the same resonance, resonance um, um, for, for council and councillors. A couple of other very quick comments, Mr Chair. Um, the other issue that goes to what you've just uh, discussed is around benchmarking. I mean, my personal view is that it's one of the, the best zoos on the planet. Um, and it would be useful if we had some, some benchmarking across that. And then the other observation I make is um, just the necessity to inform people about the, the zoo, to get something on the television and, uh, and the like. Um, if that requires an investment proposition on our part, I'd suggest it's worth it because it would enhance um, visitation and be, be really great around civic pride and, and so on, which is something I keep coming back to. We don't have a civic strategy. This goes to it, and the zoo is a phenomenal place. Thank you. Can I just respond to that? So, yes, so and al also you might want to talk about your record numbers this year as well. Yeah, so, well, so despite periods of, of closure, we've um, smashed our visitation target, which is great. Um, very happy about that, um, and uh, the hope is with the full opening of Southeast Asia next year, we'll, we'll be engaging um, even more people from our community. But we recognise that we're not reaching everybody at the moment. So a key piece of work for us is ensuring that we're resonating with all parts of our community, not just those that can afford to visit us at the current time. In terms of the TV programme, it's funny you should ask because we're actually um, we're working up a proposal with um, Magnetic Pictures and Discovery Channel at the moment. Um, so they are out actively fundraising for um, a zoo TV series that focuses on primarily on the conservation work we do both within the zoo and in the wild. Um, and when I started with the zoo back in 2010, one of the my first impressions of Auckland Zoo was the Zoo TV series where we had 12 seasons of it. And that absolutely more than anything else connected the people of Auckland and generated that civic pride in the zoo in a way that we've not been able to do since that TV series finished. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chair Pippacoon. Thank you, Mr Chair. Atamaria, tēnā koroa. Thank you for that brilliant presentation and great to get such a comprehensive update. I think that was really worthwhile. Good to hear that Councillor Walker is going to support the 5% on which the investment in the zoo is based on. Um, <laughs> um, but um, just I did have, I have a couple of questions. Um, but, you know, it's good to, to, just to hear all the enthusiasm for the, the zoo and the best practice work that you're doing. Um, could do you talk a bit further around what you're doing for... Um, around travel management and access to the zoo for staff and for visitors and if there's any update on the precinct car park and how that might operate into the future that will support the zoo and, and visitors access. Thank you. Well, that, so that, that's a massive subject. I'll try and summarise it into um, 30 seconds a minute. Um, so yes, for the last couple of years, we've been working on a precinct-wide accessibility project, so linking up with the college, with MOTAP. Um, the ultimate aim is to shift. So after price, um, the, the next barrier to visitation is actually parking. Um, so we know parking is a major issue at the zoo, and the long-term solution is not to provide more and more car parking, but is to shift people to more sustainable transport options. And so that accessibility project is looking at how we achieve that through better links with Auckland Transport and provide a better bus links. Um, one of the issues we've got is that we, people can't get from um, Baldwin Avenue train station to the zoo easily. There's no bus route there. Um, so th those ongoing conversations with Auckland Transport about the cost of getting on public transport to the zoo need to continue. Um, I understand that Motat are building a new car park um, or starting that shortly, so that will increase capacity on site. Um, but as I say, the long-term solution is to shift people from arriving in cars. Um, there is a plan towards, and we're going through the consultation phase at the moment, um, to introduce paid parking to the precinct, um, which, which will allow us to more actively manage the traffic situation on site. And transport, I believe, are doing limited time parking on the road as well. 
Um, but it's given the increased use of that precinct and the increased role of, of Pasadena and Western Springs College, juggling all those needs, particularly at certain times of day with school arrival, school leaving, um, is becoming an increasingly increasing challenge. And I've noticed a difference personally now arriving at work in my car, sorry, from West Auckland, um, is, is the traffic situation and the congestion around that site um, is becoming increasingly problematic. Um, Auckland Unlimited um, is committed in the next 12 months through the LTP to doing a precinct master planning, which will also include, I believe, a transport and accessibility component. But it's something that, that desperately needs a precinct-wide approach desperately needs all stakeholder involvement and isn't something the zoo is really um, set to solve on our own. Thank you. If, um, it might be something of interest to all councillors to understand more about the precinct parking plan for the whole, like that incorporates MOTAT and Western um, Springs Football Club and that whole area, and it might be something that we can get through to the planning committee if that's of interest to all councillors. Um, I did have just one other part, if that's okay. Just... It was great to hear about the marine conservation reserve idea and I just wonder, we've got a few members of the Horaki Golf Forum around the table and I'm co-chair and I'm sure there'd be a lot of interest in hearing more about that at the forum and I just wondered if we could hook you up and that we, because it might be something that the, the Horaki Golf Forum would very much like to get behind and support. We'd be absolutely delighted to do that. It's something that Claudine and I are particularly passionate about. And it's something that, that you don't necessarily automatically associate with the zoo and marine conservation. Um, but, but we are uniquely placed as a city to do something about this. And I think it's, it's compelling enough that we can get the entire community engaged with it. So, yes, be absolutely delighted to engage on that forum. Thank you. Mr Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member Karen Wilson. Ah, sorry. sorry, I can... But I agree um, everything that everyone has said, very, very impressive. I, I just want to um, test something else with you, if I can. So um, council-controlled organisations recognise the critical role of Māori um, in making Auckland the world's most livable city. So as I watch the presentation, and even as I look on your web um, page, I'm not seeing that focus, so I guess it's a general, simple question. Where, other than um, the inclusion and in your values, um, where they are in te reo, where you do say that everybody's kaitaki, which is a little bit um, problematic, where do you think it's most accurately reflected? So that's absolutely legitimate challenge and thank you for flagging it and and you will tell by my accent that um, I am originally from the UK um, we have a leadership team that is entirely expatriate and we've recognized it as, as a significant gap within our organization that, that our knowledge of Te Ao Māori and Te Reo is not where it should be as an organization um, but we are on a journey and and um, I can talk more about that um, in more detail and provide the, our, our Te, te Ao Māori engagement plan. Um, and I'd love to have the opportunity to do that with you. Um, but we recognise it as a significant gap in our knowledge at the moment. Um, we are on a journey. Um, there's a number of things we've done um, over recent years that speak to that, such as the introduction of, of bilingual wayfinding, about the increasing introduction of Te Reo, um, in the operation of the zoo, um, in terms of our engagements with Manafena directly as a zoo, but also through Auckland Unlimited. We're actually out in the market at the moment um, for a Kaupapa Māori advisor, a uh, role specific to the zoo that will provide support in that role. Um, when I first started 11 years ago, it was very difficult to tell that you were in a zoo of this whenua. Um, it was very much a Western-focused zoo, um, so very similar to a European zoo experience or a US zoo experience. I firmly believe that over the last decade, we've shifted ourselves to much more of a, being a, a zoo of this land of Aotearoa and New Zealand, um, and it's reflected in the experience that you have on site. 
but we have an awful long way to go. I fully recognise that, and that's something that not just the zoo recognises, but Auckland Unlimited recognises in our strategic intent. So there's absolutely a commitment, but we're just at the beginning of the journey. Just, just one further. Up. I, I, I appreciate um, the honesty and the answer, but I'm looking also to Auckland Unlimited and why, uh, if they have committed and have spe uh, specific actions around that, why it hasn't been incorporated in Auckland. I take your point in terms of it being a journey. Uh, all I would say is um, it'd be really good next update to see whereabouts on that journey you actually are and whether there is any viewing that can be shared on your web page that will also indicate where you are. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Darby. Thank you. Um, and, and welcome. And uh, look, I'm, I'm really excited what I, what I hear and what I need to see uh, at the zoo. Um, but I'm just going to dwell on something, and I, d I don't want you to take this as a criticism, and it follows on from the, the line of inquiry of, of Councillor Coombe. I um, recently went to an event called Auckland's Future Now, and the Prime Minister spoke at it, Mayor, you spoke at it, Knight spoke at it, academics spoke at it, and they told me how to get there. And they said, yeah, I had a choice of four car parking buildings, and there was nothing, it was in the city centre, and there was nothing about how to get there by public transport. I, I went to your website, and I looked at, how do I get to the zoo? And I have to go through... Um, I think I have to go through, I finally found, go visit. It's not through accessibility. That doesn't tell me how to get there. Then I go to maintenance and works. And then I drop down to how to get there. And then I'm told about some car parking. Then I'm told about public transport. And then I'm told about something else. It's actually, right now, it's really difficult to find out how to get to the zoo. So it doesn't surprise me that car parking is the number one issue because that's what you promote most, once you actually get there. So I, I guess I'm looking at your comment about Baldwin Avenue. There is actually a connection. There's a bus connection from Baldwin Avenue, not at the station. It's a nine-minute walk. I'm just making this point because we have to turn our whole, all our organizations on their heads regarding the carbon footprint of our whole business. And our whole business is not just on site. It's actually about our customers getting there as well and measuring their footprint and getting to and from our businesses. I'm encouraged to hear of the work, but I would suggest there's actually some immediate changes that could be made on the website to tell our customers today how to get to the Auckland Zoo sustainably. And I've looked at the number of bus services, and there are at least six bus services that run down, I forget the name of the road, the road that Great, great North, thank you. Yeah. Do you think there could be some more immediate changes in how you um, tell your customers how to get there? Thank you for that. And absolutely, I will go back to our marketing and comms team later this morning and look at where it's sat on our website. That, that was something I wasn't aware of. If it's difficult to find, then that's not absolutely how it, absolutely not how it should be. Um, shifting the culture of people with, with kids and push chairs and picnics to come on the bus rather than the car is a longer journey, but absolutely the information about how can people can reach us through public transport should be front and centre. So thank you for flagging that. And that does not take anything away from the immense, positive, world-leading work you're doing. Well, I appreciate that, and thank you for flagging it. Good. Thank you. Uh, Member Wilcox. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is it's referring to your slide about the reductions in targets and how much you've saved so far. Has that translated into a saving in dollars? Has that translated into a saving of dollars? In operational costs? Yeah. Um, not that we've measured, so I think I think we'll all be aware that, that sometimes doing things a sustainable way has an additional cost to it. So, so with the zoo, we've seen significant investment thanks to the support of council in our capital infrastructure as part of the renewals program. So certainly by investing capital money in infrastructure, we've been able to reduce operational costs and utility costs. Um, have you got 
more information on that? Yes, so it, it, it will represent overall long-term savings, but I haven't got those um, those figures, unfortunately, this morning. My second question, and it kind of touches on what, what Karen was asking about, was um, I take it from this slide, the, the waste minimisation and all that you've carried on with, um, uh, you've had no input from Tata Fenra regarding that. Is that correct? So just to clarify the question, no input from Tanata Fenner on, yeah, on yeah, the waste had, management yeah, issues? Yeah, on any of those pros, pros, projects. Uh, so so um, Mana Fenner through um, Auckland Unlimited are aware of the program, absolutely. We've talked um, with Nati Fatwa about that specifically. Um, but more widely, no, there's not been an engagement. Uh, okay. Nati no. Fatwa? I'm, I'm Nati Fatwa. I never heard it. But never mind, we'll Sorry. carry on. Okay. Um, uh, Look, I, I like the stuff you're doing. I'm not saying that. Um, but one of the key points of being a mana whenua or tangata whenua is recognising where these these uh, animals come from. And I, I was, because I took the kids around, you know, gee, that was a fool me, $150 later, and I'm, I needed a wheelchair when I left. Um, but what I want to know is, you know, I didn't see anything in looking at that slide about the orangutans, you know, because, you know, the, the name in Basa, Indonesia, is is that that's describing the ma old man of the bush, eh? You know, and I didn't see anything about Indonesians or, you know, or, or those people from that area or from Malaysia. Or, and, and, I mean, that's the connection that, that indigenous people have with these animals. And I think that's a there's a there's a whole area there that we're missing out. We're talking about the animals, but they're out of con out of context with the people. And I think that's that's the part that I kind of didn't see. And when I saw that picture, that's what it reminded me of all those people that are living in the bush with those animals. And they they they're going extinct too. Their culture's disappearing as well. So you know that's a real corridor there. And I completely agree with you. And and looking at uh, the whakapapa of our animals, where they're from, and relating that to indigenous communities is, is something that we're actively considering as part of our advocacy framework at the moment. Um, so yes, completely agree with the point you're making. Thank you. And um, I think, uh, Kevin, it probably it would be good at some point. I'm sure you do have uh, the data because council. Community facilities say on the water saving and energy saving, they have managed to match with, you know, how much less we're paying in water bills or paying in power. You know, so it would be good to see the economic benefits from the sustainability benefits too. Um, you know, not today, but um, sometime in the future, that would be awesome to quantify that. Last question, um, we'll go for, to Councillor Dalton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, the zoo is a really, really special place, right? And it creates so many memories, and it's certainly come ahead in leaps and bounds since I was a child, so uh, 50 years ago. And now my, my children, one of the first places they take my grandchildren is the zoo. So it's looking wonderful. My questions were exactly the same as Member Wilson, and it was going to, and you've answered it, it was going to go to um, how much signage do you have in Toreo? How do you incorporate the Te Ao Māori world? So I would love to come and have a visit and listen to your journey in that space um, at some point in the future to really understand how um, you're taking it forward with um, the mana whenua, matuaka, Māori. Thank you. And very, uh, we will definitely organise that visit, um, Councillor Dalton, ensure that all just connects up. Um, and very last, last question from um, Councillor Watson. Oh, th thank you, Mr Chair. And it is just a quick one, and it, and it goes to the, the, I don't think anyone else has raised it, in terms of the, the admission costs for, for getting to the zoo. So, so just looking here, the family pass, is that the $45, is that the cheapest one for one adult and two children? Is that the, if we uh, leave aside the annual subscription? You're testing my knowledge of our admission price. So adult is 24 yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, with the two adults, one child, yes. Yes, okay. So, yeah, I'm just going what's on online, online here, some, yeah. sometimes not up to date. So I just wonder in terms of all the investigations and everything that go on as far as accessibility goes, 
poor families and particularly families that you know uh, are perhaps uh, you know sh struggling a bit and and how accessible um, you know 50 bucks in this instance or if a, you know if there's two adults and a couple more children come along um, that is pushing the envelope a bit for significant numbers of families around New Zealand in the current environment. So I just wonder if there's any thought going into that situation. Uh, completely, absolutely, Councillor Wasser. It's something we're, we're acutely aware of. Well, we've actually dropped the ticket price. We, we've done a lot of research and price modelling over recent years. Um, two years ago, our adult price was $29. So we've dropped it down to 24 And actually, we're able to generate more admissions revenue as a result of that um, because the numbers increased. Um, my ultimate goal, if I can say that, is to make the zoo free, as National Zoo in Washington, D.C. is, as St. Louis Zoo in Missouri is. The zoo should be a, a resource that everybody in Auckland who wants to visit should be able to visit, and price shouldn't be a barrier. Unfortunately, our operational model and funding does not allow us to do that at the current time. Um, so we will continue to make the zoo as affordable as possible within the budget envelope that, that we're allocated. Just, just finally, Mr. Chair, thanks. I know in the past some of our, uh, and it's going back a bit, predating the super city certainly, where uh, certain of our facilities, there were sometimes promotions to certain areas to make them free for, for a set period of time while not compromising the operation. Now, I don't know if it ever got to the zoo, but it certainly got to other facilities at Auckland Council, or the old Auckland City Council used to run. So I just chucked that in there as a, as a possibility maybe for certain areas where that could be opened up in a half price or whatever as a promotion without compromising the, you know, the wider operational integrity of the zoo. Thanks. And just in um, saying that, I think those are, are definitely good questions, but I think we had looked at that about two years ago, and as far as I remember, the main reason our zoo prices are actually the cheapest in the country as well as one of the cheapest in the world is because it's subsidised by the council, which is why we should always stay as a council-owned uh, zoo. I think uh, Wellington is Sydney and um, Australian zoos are double the cost, 40-something dollars a, a person, and kids are 20-something, and uh, I think Christchurch is about 40 bucks a person as well. So I think it shows even... You know, that is $24 is very expensive for some people, but it shows having the Auckland Zoo, subsidi Auckland Council subsidising or helping out keeps that lower than anywhere else. Um, but more work to do in that area, definitely. Um, <laughs> I said last question three times now, so I've got a, a, a quick question from Member Wilcox and then a quick question from Councillor Young, and then we're going to have to move on. This is totally personal. Um, do we get a discount for using our gold card? <laughs> Yeah, there is a discount for gold card holders. Something we modelled, I would love to make it free for gold card holders, as it is with some other cultural organisations, but it, we, we modelled the cost of that. It would actually cost us, I think it was 800000 to 900000 a year to do that. Um, so we couldn't actually, I'm really sorry, we can't afford to do it. But give me a call, I'll, I'll, I'll show you around. <laughs> it's not free, but it is a 25% discount. For, yeah. Last question, Councillor uh, thank you very much for your good job and looking forward to see the ongoing and complete uh, the plan. Uh, I just want to ask a very quick question is, how many reserve or the, the land for the future development outside the planning now we hold in there? I'm thinking some future development. How many reserve the land or the space? So just to clarify the question, it, the footprint of the zoo is are you talking about within the footprint of the zoo or beyond? Okay, so, so his, no, so there are no current plans to expand the footprint of the zoo. So basically everything that has been developed on the site, so we've developed the site to the full extent. What we're doing now is a renewals program of replacing old infrastructure, some of which is almost a century old, with new infrastructure. So it's not expanding the site or expanding into new areas, it's replacing old infrastructure with new infrastructure. Um, 
Thank, thanks very much, Kevin and Claudine, for a, a, a great presentation and for, you know, I think it, we're all inspired by what you're doing there. Um, but Glenn's inspired me to say this. Um, don't give it to the oldies, like Glenn and I. Give it to the kids from deprived backgrounds. Make them free. Don't worry about the gold card holders. Thank you. <laughs> that was something that I could not say or, w <laughs> or would not say. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's been a, a really informative presentation. There's a lot more to see, and I'm sure any um, councillor or member around the table um, who wants to have a visit with you, um, you've always been very good at um, you know, allowing us to visit or check things out or, or email you various questions, so definitely going to do more of that. And I think that if anyone around this table or in this room has not been to the zoo late, it's pretty phenomenal. It has been a massive change. Um, you know, it does feel like you're in a native forest walking around there now compared to even when um, I was a kid, you know, pretty close to Angela, uh, Angela's um, childhood. But, uh, you know, it was it was pretty much concrete, uh, concrete cages back then. And, that you know, so it's great to see so, so much different and the focus on conservation and breeding programs, especially of our native um, animals and birds as well. So thank you so much. So uh, Councillor Coomer's. Moved and Walker second. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much.